good morning, happy Tuesday. Um, I have a friend, I wanted to say hello. This is Evie, she is the mascot of my apartment. And I think you met my orchid already, but this is my orchid, Sal. And Sal is, you know, happy, blooming. Um, yeah, so Evie's gonna join us for a video today. Um, oh, just to officially let you know, the district decided to do credit, no credit for the semester. I'm sure you're not surprised. Um, what that means is the final grade for the semester is going to be credit or no credit. It will not impact your GPA. Um, so I can go into more detail about it uh, you know, on Thursday or something, but, um, that doesn't mean that you should, that you can necessarily just, like, kind of sit back and do nothing, <laughs> but because, um, the work that you do or don't do in, uh, you know, this last segment can, can, can be contributing to, you know, do you fall in credit or, you know, no credit, and Mr. Wang has the, um, uh, it's up to him to kind of decide where that threshold cutoff is um, between credit and no credit I would say maybe safely assume that it's a you know somewhere above a passing grade so maybe above a D or so um, but again like you don't quote me on it because I'm not making the decision about where the cutoff is for credit or no credit um, also I really hope that you know even if like this the stuff you do for this unit wasn't like you know really impacting your grade um, like, I really hope that you just take an interest in, you know, what we're learning in this unit or, you know, the activities that we do because it's not just that, you know, the stuff you're learning now might be, you know, preparing you for things that you learn, you know, next year or whatever, but honestly, um, because this unit is about human impact and, you know, our actions affect on the, on our, like, planet, Literally, if you are planning to be a person living on this earth for the rest of your life, this information applies to you and is useful for useful to you for like helping you for the rest of your life. So like, I just hope that you can find like, you know, an intrinsic motivation that has nothing to do with grades or school or whatnot, just to be, you know, remotely interested in uh, learning about this and engaging with this. Okay, so. Today, we are going to talk about climate change. Um, okay, so climate change in the big picture uh, is due to, you know, using non-renewable sources of energy too much, which is our fossil fuels like, um, you know, oil, petroleum, uh, natural gas, coal, um, stuff like that and using that too much is really on the large scale uh, driving uh, climate change or global warming. I'm going to move myself out of the way. So I'm going to explain how this picture is working first. So everything starts with the sun, right? You have the energy from the sun that's coming down to the earth. It literally powers every single thing that happens on this earth naturally. So when the sun is shining onto the earth, there, um, I'm starting on the left of the picture, um, the first arrow on the left. Some of the some of the sun uh, energy is going to is not even going to make it to the Earth because it's going to be reflected back out into space by uh, the at our atmosphere. But then you know some solar energy is going to pass through the atmosphere and land on the Earth. First of all, some a lot of this energy is just you know bounced back off the Earth you know from. Are our polar ice caps because it's white and white is going to reflect the sunlight so so then like even less Sun is going to be actually absorbed by the earth but that energy that is absorbed by the earth is going to heat up the earth that's why we're not as frozen as say Mars um, and then eventually the heat that is absorbed by the earth is going to like long story short the, the heat absorbed by the earth after going a through a few transactions is going to be, uh, you know, sent back out of the earth and out towards space. The problem is if greenhouse gases are trapping the heat uh, and preventing it from escaping out of the atmosphere. Now remember all the way back to the first lecture, actually I think that was the last lecture, whatever. The, the last time I spoke, 
when we talked about that energy balance of energy in equals energy out and that helps to keep the earth at a balanced and stable temperature well greenhouse gases preventing some of the heat from leaving is causing the energy in from the sun to be greater than the energy leaving the earth and that's when you have energy trapped and it's starting to accumulate in the earth on the earth uh, that's when you start you know an increase in energy is correlated with an increase in temperature that's basically what it ends up being and that's why the temperature of the earth starts increasing and the climate starts changing um, other problems with you know non-renewable sources of energy uh, is that you know it's at least in our lifetime it's not it doesn't like regenerate it's not renewable because it takes so long to develop uh, those fossil fuels so eventually it's gonna run out possibly in our lifetime so this is not a long-term supply for our energy um, yeah and then more specifically the combustion of these greenhouse gases which means burning them uh, which is you know you have you burn these you burn these fossil fuels when you drive your car that's why exhaust comes out of your car um, it gets burned to make electricity for you so that you can turn the lights on at night and charge your computer and everything else that you charge. And this combustion is releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which is going to be trapping the energy that is supposed to be leaving the earth. And that's, oh, whoa, whoa. That's why global average temperatures are rising. And this increase in, in like the global temperatures, in uh, changing the climate, that is, temperature is a very, very important abiotic factor that really helps to dictate what can live there, what can't live th in, a, in a certain area. Um, and it really just dramatically affects like all the biomes everywhere on Earth. All right, so we're gonna spend a, uh, some time understanding exactly what are greenhouse gases. So. These are your these are your main offenders. Uh, CFCs uh, that stands for chlorofluorocarbons, NO, uh, uh, N2O, nitrous oxide, methane, carbon dioxide is CO2, and yes, water vapor technically is is a you know is considered you know counted as a greenhouse gas, but it really doesn't it doesn't really do much harm. Um, Carbon dioxide is the most abundant greenhouse gas, so it's the one that we spend the most time trying to, uh, you know, mitigate and, and decrease in our atmosphere just because it's the most abundant and we are causing, we are mainly causing an increase of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. Okay, how should I move myself? This is a chart that is, I'm going to put myself up here. This is a chart that is kind of just talking, it's comparing the different greenhouse gases I just listed. Um, yeah, you can see like water vapor, it really does not pose much of a threat. Um, you can see in the second column on the left where it says concentration, carbon dioxide is the, is, has the highest concentration um, in 2010 and chlorofluorocarbons has the least, no actually nitrous oxide has the least uh, concentration, but chlorofluorocarbons is pretty small concentration as well. However, that is not to be taken lightly because if you look at the next column over to the right, the global warming potential, like how much damage it can do for, for how many years, chlorofluorocarbons are like serious. They do a lot of damage to our ozone, which is a layer in our atmosphere that's protecting us. I could go into more detail if you want on Thursday, but chlorofluorocarbons are no laughing matter. They're super like dangerous to our atmosphere and they can last for like a long time, longer than we'll be alive. Um, you can see that methane is, you know, 25 times more potent than um, carbon dioxide in terms of global warming potential. Um, and so methane and carbon dioxide are the two greenhouse gases we're going to spend um, time kind of focusing on in terms of their sources and you know what we can do about it in our own in our own lives. Okay, sources of greenhouse gas. I need to move myself again. Okay, uh, combustion. 
uh, which is burning fuel, burning fossil fuels, is going to, uh, you know, release uh, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Agriculture actually is a really strong source of uh, both methane and nitrous oxide. Um, methane, um, a pretty significant source of methane is from livestock, namely cows. Um, uh, you know, cows like are eating and then they're like burping and like, no joke, like it sounds kind of dumb, but like cow burps are like a significant source of methane in the atmosphere. Um, nitrous oxide from fertilizers, because um, fertilizers tend to be uh, really nitrogen heavy just because of uh, nitrogen is usually a limiting uh, nutrient that soil is in need of to be healthy and so fertilizer is normally there to supply more nitrogen to the soil. Um, but if if uh, agriculture people are using fertilizer in an unsustainable way and um, they can that process can contribute to nitrous oxide in the um, atmosphere. Okay, so while we're on the topic of agriculture, our food choices actually like do contribute to you know the amount of greenhouse gases in the air. Um, I said that cows are, are a significant source of, of methane, um, and uh, you know, the, the, there's a movie I'll have you watch uh, later on in the week called Before the Flood, and there's a section in the movie that talks about, um, it talks more in depth about cows and their contribution to methane, um, but yeah, like, as I said before, like, uh, you know, cow burps legitly are like contributing to methane in the uh, in the atmosphere. Um, also, um, cows take up, like, the amount of land that, that has to be taken up just to, like, feed cows, um, you know, it, you, then that's more land that has to be, uh, you need to be growing food for the cows, you're using more soil, more, more fertilizer, uh, more water and all sorts of resources to feed these cows just to feed you and you know a different animal like a chicken takes up far less space because they don't have to be like grazing all day in a pasture or something like that so um, so like kind of just you know even like when it comes to your choice of meat like different meats are going to take up different amounts of resources just to get to your plate um, Palm oil is something you may not have heard of. It's a type of oil, you know, like coconut oil or olive oil, whatever. Um, but it is it's one of the cheapest uh, options for extracting oil out of a vegetable. Um, you know, so palm trees, and then the you can get extract palm oil from palm trees. And this is a prob This is becoming a problem because, uh, and you can see that there's links. In this PowerPoint, so I'm gonna post the I'm gonna post the this PowerPoint either probably in the description of this video or in Canvas, so you can you can click on these links to look at it, re, watch the videos yourself if, if you're interested. Um, the problem with palm oil is that because it is such a cheap source of getting oil that can be used in literally uh, like a lot of your packaged and processed foods, and it goes by different names. It's not always gonna go by the name palm oil. Um, um, so then it's kind of, you know, there's a high demand for it because it's cheap and it's easy to make oil out of it to put into all your processed foods. And that is leading to a lot of land being, like a lot of forests being deforested and cleared so that people, that companies can set up palm oil farms basically on land that was once a forest. And uh, all that burning of forests just to clear land to put palm trees, palm palm plantations up is first of all contributing to a lot of um, greenhouse gases in the environment it's destroying uh, it's destroying habitats in various areas of the world and then it's causing animals to go extinct because they're losing their habitat and they're getting all disturbed by all this their like land their home being burned down all around them um, yeah so like palm oil industries and plantations are really like they're a source of like deforestation happening in the world in different um like tropical rainforest areas 
And then uh, landfills. Landfills is where your trash goes. Um, the thing about landfills is that the the trash it tends to be like really, really, really packed as tightly as possible because you tr you're trying to fit as much stuff in there as possible, and it's packed so tightly that uh, there's no room for oxygen. And if things start breaking down, especially organic matter, aka your food scraps, anything that could have broken down by itself, like biodegraded, if that starts breaking down without oxygen, it actually makes methane instead of like carbon dioxide or oxygen or, or, or whatever it was going to break down into. And so then you're still creating more methane, even while you're throwing stuff away. That's why it's actually really important to compost the things that are supposed to be composted. Um, so, yeah, I think in recent years, like, you know, a lot of, like, the Bay Area has, has become really good at, like, they, they give you three garbage cans, like the trash, the recycling, and compost, and so they'll take your compost away and hopefully compost it. Um, okay, so these are a few charts. Um, We'll start with the left carbon dioxide. You're going to see that the main source of, of carbon dioxide, it tends to be combustion, um, you know, combustion to, for electricity or combustion for transportation or whatever. Uh, that's like our main source of carbon dioxide. So industries burning fuel and stuff like that. For nitrous oxide, you can see that agriculture really plays the biggest role in adding nitrous oxide to the environment. That's why we spent some time talking about um, you know, choices in our agriculture matter. Um, and the last one, what is this? Methane. Methane, again, um, a big portion of it comes from energy production, which we'll get into next week, um, but also livestock digestion, aka cows, and landfills. Okay, so this graph is showing uh, global carbon dioxide emissions, so I'm going to spend some time explaining what's happening here. The red line is the total carbon dioxide emission from either the world or the country uh, in units of million metric tons. They're not the, the yellow and the red line, they're not in the same units, so don't get confused by that. The yellow line is per capita uh, for the country or the world. Per capita means the amount spent per person in metric tons, and that's important. You know, like when with the whole like uh, you know, keeping track of what's happening with COVID-19, um, and, um, there's this website that I go to that has, like, just a bunch of data and statistics on, and changing numbers on, you know, COVID-19 by country, and the first, the first, uh, first column is, like, it'll show, it'll rank the countries in, in order of which country has the most number of cases, and I really don't pay attention to that, because while it is on some level, some kind of, um, you know, relevant to know like which countries have the most number of cases to me that is not the most important uh, number to me the most important number is the column that's kind of far to the right and it says number of cases per 1 million people and to me that is a way more important number because it it gives you a better idea of how in danger is a country like what uh, what proportion of the population is actually like suffering here so um, the U.S. has the most number of COVID-19 cases, but the U.S. population is so large, way larger than a lot of other countries in the world, that actually, if on a, you know, proportionally, the U.S. is nowhere near the top of the list on that other column of like number of cases per one million people. The actual top of that list, number of cases per one million people, is a tiny country in Italy called San Marino, where over one percent of their population has been affected by COVID-19. So similarly in this kind of graph, the total uh, carbon dioxide emission is important. It's not that it's not important, but I really pay more attention to the yellow bar, which is per capita. How much is each person in that country emitting, uh, you know, co contributing to carbon dioxide emissions? Because if you don't take into account the fact that different countries have different populations, you're going to be missing a really key factor or key point in this data. So yes, China does have the greatest total, uh, you know, total amount of carbon dioxide emissions. So that's true. But if we look at the yellow bar, per capita, the highest 
per capita CO2 emitter is Saudi Arabia, and we, the United States, are in second place. So that just kind of gives you an idea of like, maybe as a whole, our country is not emitting as much carbon dioxide as China, but per person, we are like emitting almost three times as much as people in China. So that kind of gives me a better picture of like, you know, it's maybe just that our population is not as big as China, but if our population was the same size as China, we definitely would be emitting way more carbon dioxide than China. Okay, so because of all these greenhouse gases in the, that are being added to the atmosphere, global average temperatures are rising. Um, and this is kind of a map showing, you know, which, which uh, areas of the world are experiencing the most change in temperature. The color is representative of the change in temperature. Red and orange is a higher increase in temperature. And you can see that the biggest change are in, you know, the northern hemisphere towards the North Pole. And that is because there's less water in the northern hemisphere, um, because you know, like there's, there's more land, more continent in the north part of the Earth, and so there's less water, and water is really important for moderating temperatures. Okay, so this graph is to show you that um, you know it ha it is normal that the the level of carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere it does kind of cycle it goes up and down and up and down and up and down so like that is a pattern that we've seen before but if you see how that our current level in, in two, just in 2013 it's way higher now is like this huge spike that is not following the past trend it this is now like going out of the trend it's not following what it has been doing for like ever before um and this is just a graph showing you how uh, you can see that the carbon dioxide is the black line. Um, it's in the last like 200 years, it's increasing steadily and then gets it starts increasing more steeply and the average temperature is following. So it's just like another graph showing you how temperature and carbon dioxide are linked together and temperature is following carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, so how does the climate change affect the environment? Uh, this is, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, this is Greenland, I think. Um, melting of the polar ice caps. And, you know, I just watched a thing yesterday, with the, like a planet Earth thing about, uh, you know, the North Pole and the South and Antarctica and how, like, the amount of like sea ice is decreasing um and so you have less area of like ice especially during like the summer um and like more ice is melting than ice is being reformed because of the increase in temperature and not only is that like really it's actually just like it's becoming a threat to like polar bears can't hunt as well um walruses are dying because they don't have like land to be resting on for like breeding and stuff like that and um it was just really sad to be to, to watch that like <laughs> my heart was breaking um yeah so like we're losing our polar ice caps and that's just going to be really detrimental to all the animals that actually live in that area especially because like loss of the ice caps is also affecting growth of algae which affects you know the krill crop population that are feeding off the algae and if you're losing the krill population that's just going to destroy the entire like food food web but also we're losing the area of ice that would be reflecting sunlight so we aren't be able to ref like the planet isn't able to reflect as much sunlight off the earth uh, melting of ice obviously means you have more liquid water which is causing sea levels to rise and it can destroy um, small islands such as like Kiribati is an island. If you click this video, it talks about the island of Kiribati. That's basically gonna, it's being flooded and the islanders have to keep moving their homes further and further inland because their homes get flooded. Uh, melting of permafrost up in the tundra area, it uh, releases methane um, that was kind of trapped in the permafrost, like the frozen soil. So now more methane is being released into the environment. And these changes in weather causes more storms, 
uh, more severe storms, um, you know, like hurricanes and um, tsunamis. And then with all this excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the ocean actually absorbs a lot of carbon dioxide. It helps to absorb carbon dioxide for us, but with the ocean absorbing so much more carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide in the water, it does this reaction and forms carb carbonic acid, which makes the ocean more acidic. So when the ocean is becoming more acidic, it starts to um, you know, dissolve the shells of marine animals that have shells, think hermit crabs, uh, sea snails, stuff like that. And it's also destroying coral. So actually our coral reefs are under attack and we're losing a lot of our coral reef biomes just because coral is very sensitive to acidity and temperature and coral just can't handle um, that increase in ocean acidity. Okay, so what can we do about it? What can be done? So, um, if you spend some time, like, you know, on your own, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but you can spend some time, if you can pause this video, and you can look at the different uh, strategies for prevention and cleanup. And you can see that in, in cleanup, a lot of the strategies are using the word sequester. Sequester means to store. You're basically, it's like shoving carbon dioxide into a trash can, a trash can in the earth, and trying to just hold it there and get it out of our atmosphere. And um, I, what that really tells me is that, um, like, without these strategies of prevention, strategies of cleanup are not a long-term solution because you can't just keep, like, if you only did cleanup without prevention, that'd be like continuing to clean up a spill only to spill again and clean up the spill and spill again. It's just really, it's not effective in the long term. So you need both cleanup and prevention strategies. Uh, I don't know, let me move myself up here. Um, and a lot of the prevention strategies are focused on kind of moving away from using natural, uh, sorry, uh, mo moving away from using non-renewable sources of energy, moving away from fossil fuels. Um, so for countries on like the big, big scale, um, moving to renewable energy, stopping deforestation because when you uh, cut down trees, not only are you releasing uh, carbon that was stored in the tree back into the atmosphere, but you know, then that tree isn't there to be absorbing carbon dioxide from the environment and kind of taking it out of our environment. Um, shifting to more sustainable and climate friendly agriculture so that our agriculture isn't adding so much nitrous oxide into the environment um, or into the atmosphere. And you know, agriculture is also a source of pollution for water, which we'll talk about more next week. Um, yeah, so shifting to being more energy efficient, uh, uh, shifting to renewable energy. There's some country, I forget if it's like Sweden or Norway or Finland, some Scandinavian country that has shifted to like 100%, like they're not using non-renewable energy sources. But yeah, that's super cool. And it shows that it can be done. Individuals, so this is what you could actually do. <laughs> Reduce shopping. This is not just like, you know, shopping in what you kind of think of the, think of as shopping, like for clothes or something. I would say, I didn't get a chance to, to maybe like edit this, but I would change shopping to consumption because really adjusting our consumption habits gets at the root of a lot of problems. Consumption comes in the form of the foods that we eat, the things that we buy, or the resources that we use. So. If you watch that story of stuff video, you'll remember consumption. Consumption drives a lot of problems, uh, environmental problems. Um, using le less uh, electricity if it's from, uh, you know, from non-renewable sources. Our food choices matter. Wasting food definitely, you know, don't waste food because then it's, you're just wasting the resources that we're used to you know make the food and so then all that water and everything that basically got wasted if the food like spoiled and it didn't get eaten and especially if it didn't get composted um separate organics from landfill waste um and choose ethical products so um i can talk more about this like you know in a on thursday or something like you can ask me questions but um there are several countries that are like ethical sustainable countries that are sorry uh, companies, companies, 
ethical and sustainable companies that work really hard to make sure that their products are sustainably uh, manufactured and that you know that there is there is a plan for when that product is you know is ready to be thrown away like can it be recycled and stuff like that and actually in like you know trying to be a more ethical consumer um, that's when it really helps to start learning about uh, certifications there's a lot of there's a lot of certifications that will kind of tell you like oh like something was sustainably forested like there's a certification called FSC it's like forestry sustainable certification or something and it basically means that the the trees that were cut down to make this product they were cut down in such a way that is not like deforestation it's not clear cutting the trees it's doing it in a more sustainable way and I wanted to show you um, so this is a chocolate bar that I was that was given to me and um, I'm just kind of showing you how like you can kind of be on the lookout for more certifications so sometimes at the bottom you'll see stuff like non-gmo verified or in this case fair trade fair trade means that um, it means exactly what it sounds like it's you know being traded fairly it's not like um, it's not kind of like taking advantage of the people that are like behind making this um, or like you know here you can see that it's 10% uh, you know use recycled paper or something and use like recycled paper to make this paper um, the other one that I want to show you is this is my bath towel <laughs> So this is my this is my towel, and there's there's a tag here that says Oiko Oikotex, made in green, and Oikotex is a certification system uh, that, especially if it says Oikotex made in green because there's different levels, it basically means that not only has this towel been tested for a, for like over a hundred different like chemicals, harmful chemicals, so that there are no you know chemicals. Or harmful chemicals and toxins aren't going into my towel but the made in green part implies that um, different parts of the manufacturing and processing uh, you know, stage for this towel have been audited and it is sort of certified to be ha have been made sustainably and so kind of keeping a lookout for those kinds of certifications can um, kind of help you like get a better idea of like oh like well you know when you're trying to shop ethically and like um, be more, uh, you know, sustainable and environmentally friendly in the things that you decide to purchase, and kind of like it helps you have a better idea of how to use your money or your parents' money to kind of vote for more sustainable practices. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, I will see you uh, Thursday, or I think I'm making another video on Wednesday or something like that. Okay, bye.